webinar. And we're pleased to be joined today by two guest speakers. So we have Tracy from Milton Keynes College and Helen from Market Study Group. I'm just going to cut over um, so that the guys can say hello. So Tracy, over to you. Hello, yes, I'm Tracy. I'm Director for Apprenticeships at Milton Keynes College. So I'm responsible for the college's strategy on apprenticeships and also for subcontracting. Thank you, Tracy. Over to Helen. Hi, my name's Helen Davis. Uh, I work for Market Study Group. I am heavily involved in our apprenticeship programme around the quality standards and, and the quality side of things. And we'd also like to introduce you to Jake Tween, who's going to be doing most of the hard work this morning, our apprenticeship and funding manager. So, Jake, say hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're just going to have a quick look um, through the agenda so you all know what we're going to be covering this morning. We've got a full and action-packed agenda that Jake is going to take us through, um, and we'll have some opportunity to hear from Tracy and Helen on their views around um, specific areas as we navigate through um, the, uh, the webinar this morning. Um, just also wanted to make you aware, as Jenny had mentioned at the start of the webinar, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, via the chat function, and we'll do our best to answer those at the relevant periods throughout the webinar. And we're also hoping we'll have um, a decent period of time towards the end of the webinar um, to open up to the panel for further, um, further questions. So I'll now pass you over to Jake. Thanks very much, Andy. And good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. OK, before we get started, I wanted to give just a very quick update on the reforms um, and just really a bit of background as to where we're at and why we're here. So behind everything lies um, an employer-driven reform of apprenticeships in England. And the idea is that government wants employers to have a lot more ownership over apprenticeships. And we've seen that through employer design standards and assessment plans with the new Trailblazer apprenticeships. Um, but government also wants to reform the funding models to incentivize employers to deliver more apprenticeships, and higher quality apprenticeships, particularly to young people as well. What sits behind that is a government target of 3 million apprenticeships start by 2020. So just to clarify, that 3 million apprenticeships start in the current term of parliament, so that's 2015 through to 2020. And just to put that into perspective, the previous term saw 2.4 million. So it is quite a significant area of growth that we're, we're targeting here. So as I mentioned, we've got significant funding reform, and a key part of that is the employer levy, which will come into effect from April 2017. And we're going to have a little bit of a look in more detail at the levy throughout the webinar today. We also have some new funding requirements for apprenticeship delivery, which will kick in in May 2017. And again, we're going to have a look at what those new requirements are and what that means for providers and employers in the system. And the last point on here, which is something that we will sort of reiterate and try to hammer home throughout the webinar, is that there will be separate rules for both levy and non-levied employers. So the levy is potentially a great thing. It's headline grabbing. It's got a lot of interest. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the majority of employers in the system will not be paying into the levy and that they will have their own system in terms of engagement and funding. So we'll look at both of those systems throughout the webinar today. OK, just a brief overview then of the difference between the levied and the, the non-levied. So levied employers, these are the employers that have a payroll of £3 million or more per year. Okay, so they will be required from April next year to pay into the levy, and we'll have a look at that in a bit of detail shortly. These levied employers will find a provider that they want to work with, and then they'll agree a cost for delivery between the provider and the employer. And what will happen is that there will then be monthly deductions that will be automatically transferred from the employer's account to the provider. 20% okay, will be held back for the endpoint assessment, but the remaining 80% will be split up evenly throughout the duration of the apprenticeship. Okay. In terms of the non-levied employers, so these are the smaller employers who have a payroll of less than three million, they will be required to co-invest in apprenticeship delivery. So they'll use their own funds, and in most cases, these employers will be paying 10% towards the cost, and the government will fund the remaining 90%. There are some um, exceptions to that rule, and there are some incentive payments, which we're going to look at shortly. but. Mostly it's a 90% government contribution, 10% employer contribution. Slightly more flexible when it comes to the non-levied employers in that the employer and the provider will agree um, the price, but also agree the payment schedule throughout the duration of the delivery. 
and the employer will then be invoiced by the provider. It's really important to note that the SFA won't release the 90% government contribution until they've got evidence that the employer has paid their 10% contribution to the provider. And again, we'll cover that later in the webinar, but it's a very important point to be aware of. So just in summary, we've got levied employers, so they'll pay into the levy and they'll be able to access that money through their digital account and they can use 100% of that money towards the cost of their apprenticeship delivery. The non-levied employers will be required to make a small contribution towards the cost and that's likely to be 10%. Okay, so what are the new requirements? Then I mentioned that there were some new requirements coming in May of 2017. Three key things. The first is that there is a new register of apprenticeship training providers. So anybody that wants to be involved in the delivery of apprenticeships from May 2017 will need to be on that register. The second new requirement is around the digital apprenticeship service. So this is a new digital system that's being set up primarily for those big levy paying employers. And again, we'll have a look at that in some detail later on. And the last thing is um, procurement. So if you're a provider and you wish to work with non-levied employers, you will have needed to have applied um, for an allocation from the skills funding agency to deliver to those employers. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a look at the new register in more detail. Um, hopefully you'll be aware that the, the register closed for applications on the 25th of November. Um, so the best of luck to those of you who managed to get your submissions on time for that one. Um, it will reopen at some point. However, we think that that probably won't be until around about April next year um, because providers won't find out whether or not they've successfully applied to be on the register until March. So it's likely that the SFA will have their hands full until then, and they'll probably reopen the register, we, we expect, around April time. There are three routes to getting onto the register. Okay, And the first route is what they call the main provider route. And this is essentially what you would currently call primes. So where you've got your big independent training providers, your big FE colleges, who are contracting directly with employers and delivering the substantive part of it and, and subcontracting the smaller providers. So these providers are known as main providers now, and they have to get onto the new register via the main provider route. The second category that we've got is a supporting provider. So again, if you want to be a supporting provider, you must be on that new register in order to deliver um, from May next year. And supporting providers can subcontract with a main provider. And supporting providers can only deliver up to £500,000 in terms of their cumulative delivery over the course of a year. One of the really, really important points to note um, is that SFP are really sort of hammering down on subcontracting, um, and what they're saying is that supporting providers who deliver more than their £500,000 worth will face quite a heavy penalty, and what will happen is they'll actually be permanently excluded from joining the register in future. So it's really important if you're a supporting provider that you are monitoring the various contracts that you've got and that you don't go over that £500,000 threshold. There's also a requirement for main providers to ensure that the specialist or the smaller providers that they're working with don't go over that threshold as well. So, um, I mean, those of you that were privy to the consultation that went on around subcontracting sort of in the last couple of months may have noticed that SFA originally were looking at being very, very strict around subcontracting. Um, and they were initially saying that they didn't want anyone to subcontract unless it was a very small, very specialist area of provision but I think they've recognized that that would be very damaging to the sector and it's not very realistic. So they've relaxed that, but what they have introduced is a lot of kind of due diligence and a lot of monitoring that will take place. It's really important if you are going to be a main provider or if you're going to subcontract that you are aware of the SFA rules and that you familiarize yourself with them and what requirements you'll have to fulfill from May next year. So we've got main providers so far, so they are primes who will be delivering and contracting directly with employers. You have got your supporting providers who can deliver up to half a million pounds worth of contracts. And then you've got small providers. So the small providers don't actually need to be on the new register, um, but they can only subcontract with the main provider, and they can only deliver up to £100,000 worth of cumulative contracts over the course of a year. Okay.
Um, so we're just actually going to um, get uh, Tracy to share her experience of um, going through the register and actually applying um, as, as a main provider. So I don't know if you could share share how you found it, Tracy. Yeah, obviously the, the application is in, in two parts. The, the applying to get on the register um, was, as a, as a college, is a, a relatively straightforward process. I think that the larger challenge um, that we experienced, and certainly um, some of my other colleagues in the sector, was the, uh, the, the tendering for the non-levy contract, um, which had um, six narrative questions, and, and they weren't too bad in themselves, but the the challenge around the funding and volume spreadsheet that we had to complete, um, and particularly because as we transition from frameworks to standards, the majority of the standards that we'll be transitioning to, the, um, the values aren't released. So for us to have to complete the funding and volumes for a contract that we need to have in place to support our, um, our employers in the local area um, was very challenging, very challenging. You got there in the end and got it in by the 25th. Oh, we got ours in by the 24th. <laughs> oh, well done. Yeah. Well done. Stay ahead of time. Excellent. <laughs> there is one other route actually that's not on the slide there, and that's for um, employer providers. So at the moment, there are very few employer providers, but there's a lot of interest from big um, employers now the levies coming in um, who want to deliver their own provision. Um, and I believe, Helen, that, that Marcus video you're going to go down that route? We are, yes, going to go down the employer provider route. So, yes, the, the, the register was challenging a little bit for us. <laughs> um, yes, we got in at the 11th hour, so we're all in, ready now, waiting to find out. Good luck, fantastic, yeah. <laughs> I think one of the other big challenges for people as well is that the results of that tender for the non-levied and the results of the register aren't going to be issued until March 2017, which doesn't really give a great deal of time to prepare and to get contracts and sorted and things like that for me. It's the world that we seem to live in at the moment. So. Okay. okay, we'll have a little look at some of the subcontracting rules. So I mentioned that initially SFA wanted to kind of really hammer down on the subcontractor and I think what they're trying to move away from, to be honest, is the world where people will get a big contract and they'll subcontract the whole of the delivery. Um, and take, say, a top slice of up to 40% of that. That's, that's the world that they want to move away from. So what they've done is they've relaxed it a little bit and said, well, actually, you can continue to subcontract. Um, but they have said that the main provider must deliver a substantial proportion of the delivery. Now, there isn't, as of yet, any percentage that's been attached to that. And we only have that word substantial. But I think it's, it's kind of a case of use your common sense, don't abuse the system, and you, you'll be OK. Um, but you would, I would personally think that substantial would mean deliver at least 50% of the program itself. Okay. So I mentioned that there are now going to be extensive due diligence, due, due diligence sorry, in monitoring checks for any provider who wants to subcontract. So again, I can't iterate this enough. Have a look at the SSA funding rules. Take the time to digest it all and understand it all. And make sure that you've got all of the checks in place come May so that you can prove that you are following the proper process. Another key thing to remember is that all of the funding will need to be routed through, a main, through, through one provider, and that's likely to be the main provider. So what government doesn't want is for an employer to have to try and sort out invoices, invoices to a main provider and then two or three subcontractors. So it all has to go through a single provider, and then they arrange all of the payments with the subcontractors and so forth. Another critical thing to be aware of is that Providers can't just subcontract um, any of the delivery without consulting the employer. And what they'll need to do is they'll need to actually get permission from the employer in advance before subcontracting. And that, need, that permission needs to be in the form of a written agreement. And that written agreement needs to include three things. So it needs to include the amount of funding that's retained for direct delivery. It needs to include any management fees that are associated with the delivery. And it needs to include details of subcontracting. So not only does it need to include how much each subcontractor will receive, but it also needs to stipulate what elements of the delivery are actually going to be subcontracted. So it's really important that you don't just go out and subcontract. That needs to be agreed with the employer in advance, and it needs to be in a formal written contract that contains all of those three elements. OK, the Digital Apprenticeship Service, and this is the next of the, the three things that we mentioned earlier. 
So this is the service that's being set up primarily um, in the first instance for those big levy paying employers. And it's kind of a one-stop shop. It'll be free um, for them to use. And it acts as an online search facility so that if an employer is interested in offering a particular apprenticeship, a standard or a framework, they can log into their digital account and they can find providers in their local region um, who are on the new register and who are approved to deliver that. Um, there is actually a beta version of the digital apprenticeship service that's on the government website. So if you haven't already, we would recommend that you log on and have a play around so you can familiarize yourself with it, get used to the functionality, provide them with any feedback on it as well. Um, providers will be able to actually put their details on there as well. And the provider portal will open on the 5th of December, and that will remain open until the 13th of January. It's worth noting that only main providers will be able to do that. Um, but if main providers are intending to subcontract, they can't actually put any details of um, the subcontracting on there, but they can't give access to the digital service to those subcontractors. It needs to be done by the main provider. And the sorts of things that an employer will be able to look at when they find a provider on there, and they'll be able to look at satisfaction ratings, um, so it shows a percentage, so it shows employer satisfaction rating with that provider. It will show apprentice satisfaction ratings. It shows achievement rates, um, and it also gives some really useful information about um, delivery models, so whether they do it as a day release or a block release, whether they can come and deliver on your premises, that sort of information. Okay. And the other key thing that we mustn't forget that the, the digital service will do is it acts as kind of um, almost like an online banking service for levy paying employers. So the employer can log in, and they can see how much they've got in their digital account at any given time. And they can also have a look at their monthly um, incoming and outgoing costs. So they can plan ahead for any apprenticeship delivery. So non-levied employers won't, in the first instance, have access to the digital service. But it is intended that they will have access later down the line. But I think quite rightly, government saying, well, actually, we want to get it right. Um, we don't want to try and roll it out for everybody. So we're focusing only on those big employers in um, sort of April, May time. But it's anticipated that from 2018, everybody, every employer will have access to that system. But for now, it's really important to remember, as I mentioned, that um, the majority of employers in the system will not be paying into the levy. And actually, government's calculated that levy paying employers will represent just 1.3% of businesses in the UK. The remaining 98.7% won't have a levy. They won't have a digital account, so it's really important that you know how to work with those particular employers. And that will work broadly as it does currently, in that you will need to, um, you'll be invited to tender, and you'll need to have an SFA allocation in order to deliver to those employers. So as you mentioned before, the tendering process actually closed on the 25th of November. So best of luck to those of you who, who apply to do that. And you'll find out in March whether or not you've been successful. Just some key figures around kind of that pot then for non-levied employers. There's 440 million pounds will be available between May 2017 and July 2018. And the value of those individual contracts will range from 100,000 pounds up to 5 million. And there is scope for those contracts to go up through growth requests and things like that in the future. If you have an existing contract with the SFA to deliver apprenticeships, that will be honored. So any apprentices that you have that have started before the 1st of May 2017, you'll be able to continue to deliver into, um, and they will remain on whichever funding regime, whichever set of rules are in place when they started that program. It's worth noting that SFA have said that there'll be monitoring centers, um, and they will take action against any centers if they see that they suddenly have an influx um, of new starts prior to the 1st of May. As I mentioned before, results of that tender will be released in March 2017, and delivery will start in May. OK, so just before we uh, dive into the funding side of the webinar, I just wanted to bring Tracy and Helen in and get their, their thoughts, really, on what they see as the biggest opportunities and or challenges that, that you're going to face as a respective employer or provider. So Helen, do you want to, do you want to give us your, your challenges and opportunities as an employer? Of course. Um, I think from an employer point of view, uh, apprenticeships is something that we've always 
uh, done in small numbers previously, but it's a fantastic opportunity now to be an employer provider to be able to deliver those apprenticeships internally. Um, also, it's uh, beneficial for us to be involved with more than the standards as well, mm. so that really suit our business needs for, for our future talent. So it will have its challenges, no doubt, and uh, yeah, we'll do everything that we can to overcome those as we go along. Brilliant. So it's nice to have a bit of ownership of you know the content in, in some respects. It is because what we can actually do then is bespoke our apprenticeship program with the enrichment learning that suits our business areas that we have. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Anne. Tracy, what about yourself from a provider's point of view? Probably a slightly different set of uh, opportunities and challenges, maybe. Yeah, and I think if we start by focusing on the opportunities and being passionate about vocational education, see that uh, the whole reforms is um, a really good opportunity for apprenticeships to be seen as a positive destination for young people. Um, and the fact that there are now employers that are offering degree apprenticeships as a route to leaving school and going straight into um, an apprenticeship program that has that robust outcome I, I think is um, is positive for, for everybody and as a provider what it does is it, it raises the kudos of, of apprenticeships so for all of, uh, of our teams that work in apprenticeships that maybe in the past have been um, seen almost as country cousins um, to, uh, uh, to the, the academic route um, I, I think that that's massively um, massively on my agenda in terms of an opportunity, working with employers that we haven't worked with before, uh, working with certain um, aspects of employer and um, workforce that we've not engaged with before, those are all massive um, opportunities. The challenges, I think the fact that we have got to wait until March um, mm -hmm. to know whether we've got onto the register and to know what our allocation is, it makes it very, very difficult for forward planning. Um, the challenges in working with employers who are stepping into the apprenticeship space, um, and they're particularly those ones who are paying the levy, and they're looking at how they're going to use their levy money. Um, the challenges around how do they manage that 20% off the job, um, and the fact that we can't give them very clear um, answers when they ask, well, who's going to be checking up on that? Um, how do we backfill that one day a week that if we release our our managers to go on to um, a, you know, a level five or a level seven management program? So that whole challenge around larger organisations needing to look at their learning and development strategies um, and the fact that you know the, the, the sand of time is slipping through, mm -hmm. um, but we don't have the clarity for people to really make uh, um, an action plan today. Yeah. I think, for, for me, those are the, the two biggest opportunities and challenges. Mm. Thank you for this perspective. Certainly something for us all to kind of uh, try and overcome in the uh, months, months that has really up to, uh, to April, May time next year. Just regarding that 20% off the job, actually, yes, I think I've been in the last few times I've seen the conferences and things to and emphasise to employers that that 20% doesn't necessarily mean taking them out of the workplace and sending them to an institution to learn. And they said it can be done in the workplace, in a meeting room, for example. But I think that people need to be sensible about actually that 20% is there for a reason. And in order for it to have value, don't abuse it, I think is what I'm trying to say. Don't just take someone off the job and sit them in a meeting room. If there is value in them going to, to the college or to the training provider or doing some online learning away from the workplace. Thanks, Jake. So we've got some questions flooding in now, so I'll do my best to field, uh, field them at the appropriate time. Just one that, um, that's come through, Jake, and that is, um, can an employer contract with a provider before March 2017? They can if they use the current system. So an employer can contract with a provider who has a current allocation from the SFA to deliver, um, and they'd have to deliver that within the current funding rules. So whether that's a framework or a standard, the, the set of rules would depend on that. Um, if you're talking about delivery, which will be from May 2017, the employer can't formally contract with the provider because they don't yet know whether that provider is going to be approved to deliver. So I think what they could do is they could look to have some sort of interim agreement, but it couldn't really be legally binding um, until May or until March at least when they know that that person is um, approved to deliver. 
Thank you, Jake. Um, and just one other, it's around um, the digital apprenticeship service. Uh, can, the, can the provider put their details onto the provider portal before hearing if they've been successful with that application uh, to the register of apprenticeship training providers and the tender? Yes, and I'm saying yes, as in I assume yes, because the, the time scale that's been given to providers to put their details on was um, 5th of December through to, I think, the 13th of January. And of course, providers won't know within that time frame whether they've been approved. So I expect what will happen is they invite providers to put their details on, but that won't be confirmed until the details of the register are confirmed in March. And just to add to that, we looked at the, the, beta, the beta site this morning, and um, lots of existing contract holders are already on there. So there obviously is some activity that's going on um, in, in that space. OK, I think we'll, uh, we'll head on to the next slide, if that's OK. OK, so now we're going to have a look at the funding arrangements, so how funding is going to work from May 2017. And I said that I would reiterate this point throughout, so I shall reiterate it again. Um, is that we have a different funding model depending on whether you're working with a levied employer or a non-levied employer. So employers with a payable under three million, these are the non-levied employers, they will continue to invest, um, but they'll pay just 10% with the government paying 90% of the cost of delivery. And the employers with a payable over three, bill, three million, sorry, they will be the levied employers, um, and they'll pay into that levy via PAYE, so it'll happen automatically, um, and the funds will be redistributed to them the following month via the digital account service. The government will also give those employers a 10% top-up to ensure that they get more out of the system than they've put in. And all of the money in that account can then be spent on apprenticeships. Okay, so levied employers, they can use their digital account to pay for 100% of the apprenticeship delivery. We'll have a look in a moment at some of the things that can and can't um, be included within that spend. Non-levied employers can invest in 10%. Now, the next point is um, probably particularly um, important to those smaller levied employers, so people who will be paying into the levy and will get some money back, but that money might not cover the full cost of the delivery. So what will happen is, on a monthly basis, if that employer runs out of money in their levy pot, they will basically revert to that um, co-investment model for the remainder. So if I give you a practical example of that, if an employer has £1,000 in their levy pot, but the cost of delivery for that month is £1,100, they will need to pay towards that remaining £100. So £1,000 covered by what's in their levy pot, and of the remaining £100, they will need to invest that 10%. So they will pay £10, and the government will pay £90. And then the following month, they just revert back to paying out their levy until, again, that money runs out. Okay, I mentioned that there were some incentives involved in the system as well. So from May, employers um, who have fewer than 50 staff will pay no contribution if they take on a 16 to 18 year old apprentice. So that's somebody that's 16 to 18 on the day that they start an apprenticeship. And that same rule applies to um, small employers who take on a 19 to 24 year old who is a care leader or who has an education and health care plan. From 2018, the plan is that employers will be able to use a small part of their levy to pay for apprentices who they don't actually directly um, employ, so people in their supply chain. Actually, where this came from was when the government first consulted on the levy, quite a lot of employers said, well, actually, we work with retailers, we work with logistics companies who we don't employ, but we see real value in being able to use our levy money to pay for apprenticeships within those businesses. So government listened, and they said, well, actually, yes. What we're proposing is, from 2018, an employer will be able to use 10% of the levy pot to pay for apprenticeships within the supply chain. And again, I think this is one of those things where they probably quite sensibly thought, we won't try and implement this straight away. We'll get the important things right first, and from 2018, we'll start to reduce things like this. Okay, I mentioned as well, there's a big drive towards um, getting more young apprentices into the system, and in particular, 16 to 18 year olds. At the moment, only a quarter of apprentices are within that age bracket, and government seeks to um, raise that figure. So they've announced new incentive payments. So from May, if you um, take on a 16 to 18 year old apprentice, the employer and the provider will get a £1,000 cash incentive. 
it's that's paid um, on top of kind of it's paid completely separately to the fee that's agreed. Um, and the employer can agree to give their £1,000 to the provider as well if they so choose. And that's really just to recognise the fact that it is or it can cost more to deliver to learners that fall within the age bracket. So it's partly that and partly to incentivise people to deliver to young people. English and maths. Okay, if the standard requires a particular level of English and maths and if the learner hasn't yet attained that level, so i.e. they need to do their functional skills at level two, that will be paid for by the SFA and that's not included in that funding cap. Okay, so that money will be paid to the provider, and it's four hundred and seventy-one pounds each for the English and for the math. At the moment, we have a quite complex funding regime where we've got um, framework rates for framework apprenticeships, and we've got funding bands for apprenticeship standards. Government seeks to simplify that, and from May, there will be funding bands for both frameworks and standards. Okay. So by frameworks, we mean the old SACE apprenticeship frameworks. By standards, we mean the newer trailblazer standards. So from May, there will be 15 funding bands, and we'll have a look at those shortly, um, which will dictate how much money can be spent towards that apprenticeship. And the other key thing to remember is that from May, there will be no age restrictions. Um, so even if you're a business and you have somebody um, who's 70 and you think it's appropriate to deliver an apprenticeship to them, you'll be able to do that and you'll be able to pay for that out of your levy pot, um, or the government will contribute 90% towards that cost. Jake, okay, we've just got a very quick question to come in. Um, yeah. and it's around the the, uh, the incentive for 16 to 18 year olds, um, and how that applies to levy um, levy paying employers. Would that, would that still be the case? Yes, it's regardless of the size of the employer, they still get that incentive. Um, I believe that employer providers aren't entitled to the incentives. Um, but I will check that, and we've got apprenticeship pages on our website, so keep an eye on them, and we'll frequently update them with FAQs as well. Okay, I mentioned that we would look at the funding bands. So at the moment, for the Trailblazer standards, we have just six funding bands, um, and it has been seen as a rather crude measure, because there are quite significant jumps in between some of those bands. So what um, government are doing is, from May, they will introduce 15 bands. So whenever a new apprenticeship is approved, one of these funding bands will be assigned to it. And the band will really depend on the level of the apprenticeship and also kind of the subject matter. So higher level apprenticeships will attract a, a larger sum. Um, apprenticeships that are expensive to deliver will attract a larger sum as well. Again, these are up on the website as well. So if you need to refer to them, that's fine. It's worth noting in terms of management apprenticeships, um, that the level three team leader standard has a funding band of five thousand pounds from May, and the level five operations manager has a funding band of nine thousand pounds, and the level six charter manager degree apprenticeship has a funding band of twenty seven thousand pounds. And ILM has an offer for each of those apprenticeships, so if you are interested in delivering them, do get in touch and we can help you. Okay, Jay, just before we dive into to this particular slide, I know this was a um, a bit of a pain point for, for Helen and Mark's study in terms of working out what can and can't be funded and, and what you can and can't spend your money on in, in what seems like quite a complex new world. Um, so I'll just pass over to Helen just to talk us through that a little bit more. Yes, definitely. It's something that, you know, we have a, a program mapped out for, for the 12 months and out of that is that they're thinking what can we allocate that funding to so can that train, particular training course can we use the funding for that can we use it for the assessor's time the travel and also some of the questions that we've had come out of that is how do we record it are we recording it in the correct way and so that's been a really big challenge for us is how it's how we allocate it and how we kind of record it as well going forward and I'm, I'm certain you're not alone we've got a number of employers um, on, on the webinar today, so I'm sure you're probably feeling the same way. Hopefully, Jake's going to navigate navigate for a few slides that hopefully will help to clear that up a little bit, if we can, or, or as far as we can at this stage, anyway. Yep. Yeah. Um, there is some guidance, then, in terms of what can and can't be funded as part of the apprenticeship delivery. So what will happen is, obviously, you've got the employer and the provider, and they will agree a fee. So they might agree, okay, for this apprentice, we're going to deliver for £8,000. So what can you spend that eight thousand pounds on? That's what we're going to look at now. So what can be funded um, is 
essentially it's training and assessment that can be funded and not a lot else. So if we break that down, the training um, can be counted as on the job and off the job training. And the assessment, that can be the on program assessment, so the formative assessment, which might include qualifications, it might include resources, workbooks, e-learning, blended learning, all of that can be funded. And also the endpoint assessment. So that's the assessment that will be carried out by an independent body at the end of the apprenticeship. Resit is a very, very interesting one. So in terms of both qualifications and in terms of the endpoint assessment, the guidance actually says that resits can be paid for out of the funding as long as additional learning takes place. So if no additional learning takes place, then the employer has to pay for the resit. Um, so for example, if there's a multiple choice question paper and the learner fails and then you put them into the straight away again and you have to pay for that, then the employer will bear that cost. However, if the learner goes away and does a fortnight of extra study, then that's actually included within the, the funding. Where qualifications are used, so we know that for the management and leadership standards that are approved, it is recommended within those assessment plans that you use a qualification. So that means that, that qualification can be funded as well. So that includes the registration costs and the certification costs of that qualification. So that's really good news. The list of what can't be funded is slightly bigger. <laughs> so things essentially the, the way to think about what can't be funded is I think what government and what the skills funding agency sees as employer business as usual activities. So they don't think about this funding that basically public money should be used to fund things that employers have to do day in, day out anyway. Okay? So things like um, enrollment, induction, initial assessments and diagnostics, those sorts of things can't be paid for. Accommodation can't be paid for if that's part of the, the apprentice's job. Travel costs can't be paid for under any circumstances. Um, the funds are not there to pay for apprentice wages either. The employer needs to pay that. And capital purchases, so things like laptops, you can't just buy a laptop and then claim it out of your apprenticeship funding. Other things that can't be funded, um, things like educational trips, uh, professional events. As you mentioned before, there are resets where no additional learning has taken place, then that can't be funded. This is where it starts to get a little bit complicated if you think of it in terms of the endpoint assessment and how you plan your delivery. So if the guide if the guidance says that, okay, you can use your apprenticeship funding costs to pay to reset that endpoint assessment, but only if additional learning takes place, it's impossible for you to establish at the start of the program whether or not the apprentice is going to pass or fail the endpoint assessment and it's impossible for you to say whether or not any additional learning is going to take place. So I think the easiest way to manage that is to agree with the employer the likelihood of how much, what percentage might fail and what additional learning might need to be taking place and then to build that into your costs. Because if you've agreed a fee up front that assumes that they'll pass first time and actually then additional learning needs to take place, well that money has already been paid, it's already gone through the system, you're then at a, at, in a difficult position. So these are the sorts of things that you need to be thinking about now and agreeing up front when you agree in the fees between providers and employers. Um, mentoring, that's an interesting one. So um, within the workplace, if employees and managers are mentoring the apprentice, then that can't be funded unless it's an employer provider. Okay, so we've mentioned a couple of times endpoint assessment. Hopefully everybody's familiar with that, but just just to give you a very, very quick overview, every apprentice will need to go through their own program, um, which might be qualifications, it might be blended learning, workplace assessment, but every single apprentice um, for every one of the new reformed trailblazer apprenticeships needs to do an endpoint assessment. And the idea of that is that an independent organization comes in, it hasn't been involved in the delivery, so it's not the provider, it's not the employer, they don't know that apprentice personally, they come in and they do an entirely objective, independent, synoptic assessment of that apprentice. Okay. Now, because that's carried out by a third party, so it's not the employer or the provider, that third party is likely to have a fixed cost for that endpoint assessment, and that's another important thing to remember when you're agreeing the fee. Okay. So you might agree, okay, well, we're going to actually deliver it for half the cost. So the funding cap says 5,000, but we're going to deliver it for two and a half. Well, great, you've, you've 
cut the price in half, but the likelihood is that that third party assessment body is not going to cut their price in half. That's likely to be a fixed cost. So it's just worth bearing that in mind when you're planning and when you agree what the fees are going to be. When we arrive at the point of endpoint assessment, it's actually the training provider that will need to pay for that endpoint assessment, okay? So it's not the employer, it's the training provider, and they will need to have something in place, some sort of agreement whereby they transfer the money to that endpoint assessment body and that assessment takes place. This is another really, really important thing to be aware of, is that 20% of the overall um, funding per apprentice is actually held back for endpoint assessment. But what's worth noting is it's held back until after the endpoint assessment has taken place. So if you're a provider, that, that can actually be quite a hit if you're delivering large numbers. Because none of the endpoint assessments, or very few of them, are actually priced at 20% of the value. They're normally around about 10%, 15%. So in real terms, providers are actually having to pay for that endpoint assessment upfront, and they don't get that 20% until after the apprentice has gone through that endpoint assessment. So you need to be aware of cash flow, and you need to make sure that you've got enough money in the bank to pay for all of the endpoint assessments that you've got coming up. Just before you move on, it's, it's worth balancing this with looking at the endpoint assessment and remembering that this is the first time that we'll have opportunity for apprentices to be graded. Mm -hmm. um, so whilst, it, we, it, yes, there's all the things to think about in terms of negotiating fees and cash flows, I think that's going back to raising the credibility and giving aspirations. Yeah. Uh, that's one positive thing about the endpoint assessment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. okay, just a few kind of other things to consider then. Um, I mentioned earlier on that the providers need to um, ensure that the employers pay their contribution before the SFA pays the 90%. So this is for the non-levied employers. Now, the provider needs to have evidence that the employer is actually paid, so an invoice isn't good enough, okay? because obviously the employer may not have actually paid the invoice. So providers need to have something in place to show that the employer has actually transferred that 10% contribution, and until they provide that evidence, the SFA won't release the 90% that they contribute. Another important thing to remember is that apprentices will need to be on program for a minimum of 42 days, so those payments from the SFA won't, won't start until the apprentice has been on program for that length of time. And the last thing is that for those employer contributions, so that 10%, VAT is actually payable. Okay, So we would advise providers and employers who have questions about that to speak to HMRC and just to get a better understanding of it. Okay, then, just to kind of close off this section, I've got a timeline for action. So I think we've covered all of this, but just to, to make it visual, then visual, it's a little bit easier to understand where we're at. So in November, um, applications closed for the new register of apprenticeship training providers, and applications closed for um, tenders for SFA contracts with non-levied employers from May. In December, HMRC is going to publish some further guidance for levy paying employers. So we do get a lot of questions around the real detail behind how it works and for those businesses that have got more complex staffing structures, so things like seasonal staff, part-time staff. So HMRC will be publishing some more guidance um, next month. In January, employers will be able to register for the Digital Apprenticeship Service. Um, February, um, we were joking earlier, and everyone goes on holiday <laughs> because March is when everything happens. So um, we find out in March um, whether or not you've been approved to be on the new register of apprenticeship training providers, and we also find out whether or not you've been successful in your bid um, for an SFA allocation to deliver to non-levied employers. Doesn't really give you a lot of time to prepare for delivery because come April the levy kicks in and employers start paying you with that. We think that the second round of applications to join the register will open in April. And from May, that's when the new rules kick in, and that's when the employers will start to be able to access their levy funds. So really, between March and May, we're going to be seeing a lot of activity and a lot of people um, working very, very hard to get the systems in place and the staff in place and all the agreements that they need to start delivering from May. A lot of information there, and 
totally appreciate we can't cover it all in an hour long webinar, so we've provided some links on there. Um, again, there's also some information on our website um, for providers, for provider employers, and for employers. Um, and we're putting up an FAQ section because we get a steady flow of questions, and where we get common questions and regular questions, we'll put them on there as well. Okay, thanks, for that, Jake. Just um, <clears throat> we've got a real more than steady flow of questions coming through. It's more like a tsunami at the moment. <laughs> um, so we'll do our best to get get through as many of them as we can. One of the themes that's coming up is some of you seem to be having trouble accessing the beta site for the Digital Friendship Service. Okay. We will send out the link um, along with the slides and the recording of this. So hopefully that will help. Um, so that's the first one. Um, there's also a question here um, which is around um, an employer um, saying how do we submit, how do we monitor, sorry, and submit costs for mentoring or other areas um, of delivery as an employer? Okay, this is one of the areas where there's not really that much guidance um, and we're hoping that in the December um, communications that you'll have a little bit more meat on the bones with that. If I'm totally honest, I don't think that there will be that level of detail in the published guidance documents. Um, so if you're in that position, I would strongly recommend that you contact the SFA and ask them what their requirements will be in terms of monitoring and auditing. Fantastic. Thank you, Jake. Okay, just before we kind of head into the Q&A bit, I just thought we'd, we'd wrap off, um, or close off, sorry. Um, be really interested to hear the views um, of both Helen and Tracy in terms of you know, what do you think the main impacts of this new funding model will be um, on you guys respectively? So, so Tracy, have you got your thoughts, Ross? Well, uh, as, as a college, we've obviously been delivering apprenticeships for um, a number of years, and we're used to the current funding model. All of our back office systems, if you like, um, are aligned to the, the current um, way in which we're paid. So um, I think a, a big challenge for us will be altering the way that we work, all of our business processes and the systems that we use um, to deal with both levied and non-levied employers. So I, I would say that, that that's something that we need to be focused on um, and, and we're working on a project to make sure that we're up and ready for that by, by March. Fantastic. Um, I think for us, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to be an employer provider. We've invested in apprenticeships previously, which the business is completely paid for, and it would be nice now to be able to, to gain some funding for that to support um, you know, our target and our future talent for our business. And the challenges that we've had is actually the recruitment mm -hmm. of apprentices. Um, and I think with also the dates and waiting until March to find out where we're, whether we're on the register of training providers. and then starting to recruit. We are doing some work in preparation for that, but that is being our biggest challenge at the moment is the recruitment side of, of the apprenticeship mm -hmm. for, the new, for the new talent coming into business. Yeah, absolutely. A really key thing to consider because a lot of the questions that we're getting at the moment is how can I spend my levy? Mm -hmm. You know, and the questions beyond that, you know, how can you actually recruit apprentices, engage them into your organisation, make them add value and actually get them to stay with you as well. Yeah. Because um, as uh, providers will will know from bitter experience, it's, you know it's a difficult task. So um, something not to be taken lightly. There will be some functionality in the digital apprenticeship service that um, allows you to find an apprentice as well. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Okie dokie. So we're, we're over to Q and A now. Really, I'm going to try and cover off um, some of the key questions that have been coming through. Um, so I'm just going to open up to relevant members of the panel. I've got a question here in relation to EPA. Um, it's an interesting one, actually. It's, um, if EPA actually costs nearer to 10% and the 20% has been held back, what happens to that other 10%? It's a very good question, and I think that the 20% model can be seen as a little bit cruel, but um, also it's, it's emulating kind of what happens in the current system in terms of what's held back. So, yeah, to be honest, providers may see themselves taking a hit with that one, um, particularly where the EPA is, say, 5% of the cost, but 20% has been held back. Um, but yeah, that was part of the consultation, um, and we did encourage people to, to feed that specific point into it to make SFA aware, but that is what's come out of the published guidance. So yeah. the 20% will be paid. 
Um, it's worth noting that the apprentice doesn't have to pass that endpoint assessment for the provider to get the 20%. They can fail, but the provider will still get the money. Okay, fantastic. Let's have a look. Let's have more coming through. Um, there's a question here around um, how bespoke can we make our training? I believe this is probably from an employer within the structures of the apprenticeship standards. I think I'll maybe uh, pass over to actually both of you. So, uh, <laughs> I'll start, start with Tracy, because um, obviously from a provider point of view, you're looking at yep. delivery models as yep. we speak. So what's your thoughts on that? I think um, it, it depends very much um, when you look at the standards that you're, you're delivering. Um, that the whole point of moving to standards is to make it employer-led and to ensure that as employers, you get the training that you need to develop your workforce. Um, so therefore, we should be able to um, pass that negotiation with any provider is to sit down and uh, design your, you know, your perfect employee, what skills and knowledge and behaviours would they have. Um, that should match um, exactly to the standard and therefore you should be able to build in um, training that develops that individual. I think the challenge will always be that it has to be relevant to the standard. Yeah. So in that negotiation, as a provider, we would be we would be having to ask ourselves and do that check. Uh, so where does this match? And uh, our job as as educators would be to step employers through through that route and do the best that we can mm -hmm. to create um, a valuable program for the employer. Fantastic. And, and from an employer's point of view, I guess you're looking at it from you know a slightly different angle. They're your people, you know. That's so, right. Um, have you been about that, Helen? Uh, we actually sit with all our different business areas that are looking to, to, to have apprentices, and we will actually look at the standards, look at the job role. We're very fortunate that we know our people and the roles that we do, that they do. So being able to map that training against the standards. Mm -hmm. We are in quite a good position from that point of view, so it, we can map it to the standards that meets the business needs. So, our question to our business areas are: What do you want that person to look like at the end? And a, a little bit like Tracy said, you then map that to the standards and the training that you're providing to, to those individuals. Fantastic. Okay. We've also got a really interesting question come through around: um, Do you have to take on new apprentices, or can you use this funding for? Uh, apprenticeships um, for, for your existing team. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'll just back that one off quickly. So one of the, the key advantages to the management apprenticeship standards is actually you can use them with your existing team members if they require um, that particular skill set to upskill them in their current role or for the role that they're performing. Um, therefore, management is a good way to use um, your levy pot or to engage with apprenticeships to increase leadership capability across the organisation. So, and with the eligibility increasing from, from the old days where prior attainment was, was, was taken into account, we're now in a world where actually if there is a reason for that person to do the training, regardless of their prior attainment, they can be signed up onto um, new apprenticeship standards. Yeah. Um, so that's a real big opportunity for organisations out there. Um, we've got lots coming through about the 20% 20, 20 um, and, and the challenge that that presents. Uh, market study, you obviously guys will have looked at this 20% um, you know, off the job piece. Yes. It doesn't obviously need to be out of your premises, but um, just be interested in your thoughts as to how you're going to embed that in, if that's okay. Uh, certainly, the areas of our businesses that these uh, apprentices will be going into will have a um, dedicated training team, so we have dedicated training functions in each location that we're looking to, to place apprentices, or even do apprenticeships with existing members of staff. Um, so um, we have our own internal e-learning uh, management system, so we will then map that with the business. Um, our, we are very fortunate our apprenticeships or new apprentices that come into the business are surplus to headcount um, and it's come from the senior management uh, authority that we will be able to pull them off the training as and when we need to so they will have a full 12 month program mapped out of on the job and off the job learning. Uh, as a provider um, in, in talking to employers I think this is where the the negotiation and the design of the apprenticeship program is absolutely crucial at the beginning because employers often 
lose sight of the investment that they make on a day-to-day -day basis in passing on knowledge and skills um, from one member of staff to another. That is on-the-job training. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's um, really important in that design to understand, um, as, as Helen said, what, what training does the organization do anyway? Where does that link to the standard? Where does that link to the endpoint assessment? And that's where you can start to really clock up more of a percentage than you realize mm -hmm. in what you're doing naturally in yeah. developing your staff. So yes, it's important to think about it, and you know it's important to recognise that you're investing in your employees for the future, and you shouldn't be expecting them to do all of their study at home at weekends and the evening. But when you when you take on board the wider remit of developing an individual, um, I don't I don't think that the twenty percent is going to be a deal breaker. Mm. Fantastic, great perspective. Thank you both. Um, it's taken a while, but um, we have got a question here about Ofsted, which I think um, <laughs> I'm surprised it's taken this long, but, it, but it's here. So um, it's basically just asking how would the Ofsted um, inspection regime work, um, and specifically in upskilling existing employees, as I think we've just mentioned. The first thing is you know, you've got to make sure there's a real need to upskill that member of staff. Um, you, know, you can't just pick, put people on management programs that are, have no need or requirement for it. So that, that's the first thing. Um, and also the wider piece is, yes, Ofsted will uh, play a big part in this. You know, for employers that are going down the employer-provider route, that is a huge consideration, you know, because if you get a bad Ofsted um, result, it doesn't look good for you as an organization, you know, even if only apprenticeships are a small part of what you do. So, you know, we're urging employers to take um, you know, apprenticeship delivery very seriously because you are opening yourself up to Ofsted inspections, which, which in essence makes sure that good quality of learning happens, um, you know, for, for our apprentices. So something to be taken into account. And uh, providers, Tracy, you'll be, uh, you'll be well used to Ofsted, I'm sure. And, uh, yes, yes. And, and in fact, um, attending a number of conferences over the last 12 months um, where Ofsted have been guests speakers, they recognize that um, this is a big change for themselves and so therefore their inspectors are going through um, an upskilling program so that they uh, see the different perspective as employer providers coming into the market uh, and as the uh, nature of apprenticeships are changing, um, Ofsted inspectors um, are, are human and um, they, they, they they need to see that the landscape is changing, and, and that's the space that Ofsted are, are in at the moment. Fantastic. So watch out, everyone. Okay, uh, here we go. Right, we've got a, a really good question here, actually, around um, in terms of infrastructure support, really. Um, so if you're an employer provider, can the wages of the training manager be paid for um, if mentoring? It goes on to say, an example, um, if 20 hours a week um, are spent, that, that individual training manager is spent with apprentices, um, can the costs be claimed back? Um, this is from a levied employer, and it's quite an interesting one. If they're an employer provider. If they're an employer provider, can essentially, can some of the cost of the training manager's time uh, that's going to take place in terms of mentoring, yeah. logistics of, uh, registering and, and, and general delivery support, of. delivery of. Yeah, so that's, if it's directly related to the delivery to that apprentice, then absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think you've just got to go careful with that because obviously, you know, it's got to be justifiable. Uh, we can't have, you know, £50,000 salaries for training <laughs> managers that are being covered by, by the levy, um, uh, you know, you need two or three apprentices on there. So, you know, you need to make sure that that is in, 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 in account with and context with what you're actually delivering. Okay, so we did have some other questions, which I'm afraid we haven't had a chance to get round to. We're out of time now, so um, we'll do our best to cover. We've covered most of the questions. There's a few that we haven't managed to get to. We'll try and cover those off on our FAQ area on our website. Um, but uh, I'd like to just extend a massive thank you to Helen and Tracy for your time and perspective. Um, I hope that it's added a wider richness to, to this webinar uh, here.
hearing from you, and thank you to Jake for, for all the work there. Thank you, Andy. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'm going to pass over to Jenny, who's going to close the webinar. Yeah, fabulous. Okay, um, thanks so much to everybody that attended the webinar today. We nearly had nearly 100 people on the webinar, so that's fantastic turnout. So thank you for joining us. We hope that you found it uh, really useful. We will be sending out to you the slides and also a recording of this webinar, so you can share that with your colleagues if you need to. Um, and thank you to um, our presenters on the um, webinar today. Shortly after uh, closing down the webinar, you will receive a feedback um, form, so an electronic feedback form. We'd really appreciate it if you can take a few moments um, to just fill that out. It is a quick, short feedback form, so would appreciate it if you could fill it out for us. Well, we hope to see you on one of our other webinars in the future, um, but for now, uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.